computer. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. The Jason Cabinet Experience is brought to you by Cabinet HR. At Cabinet HR, we deliver HR to companies with 49 or fewer people with our HR platform while providing you with a dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is Miguel Ayala. Miguel, are you ready to be great today? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Let me pull up your bio. Sounds good. Miguel has more than 30, excuse me, Miguel has more than 20 years of experience in engineering, leadership, and management of multidisciplinary engineering teams developing aircraft, launch vehicles, spacecraft, and associated ground support equipment in high profile government and commercial space programs. He is passionate about contributing to groundbreaking innovation in space exploration and aerospace transportation. Now we're gonna, before we're gonna geek out for a minute. <laughs> With the intent of becoming an effective, well-rounded leader, he has devoted his entire career to gaining a broad background in engineering and leadership, encompassing small startups and large corporations, design analysis, testing manufacturing, propulsion structures, mechanisms, and thermal fluid systems, technical leadership projects, and people management. Previous programs he's worked on include the ULA Vulcan rocket at Balkan, Argonaut spacecraft, craft, and A2100. 2100 satellites at Lockheed Martin, Falcon 9, and Falcon Heavy Rockets at SpaceX. I'm sure you do a podcast each one of those little things you've done in the past, Miguel. You have mm -hmm. a definitely impressive breakdown. So, Miguel, what do you focus on right now? So, right now, I am leading um, a, a, an aerospace startup called the Philian Aerospace. And at Philian Aerospace, we are essentially putting together a one stop shop for CubeSat integration and launch operations. Um, for, for low cost on demand and more importantly we're using green propulsion technology to make this um, not only low cost and, and, and um, uh, you know highly efficient and quick but also environmentally friendly so we're going to talk more about you coming more detail later on mm -hmm. but you're you're in the denver area correct correct mm -hmm. what, what's the tech and startup scene like there because you know people think in tech you know startup scene they think about you know san francisco mainly some, some sometimes tech sometimes seattle austin maybe boston new york city what's it like in denver right now so denver is up and coming denver is one of the, one of the hotter areas uh, for um you know for tech and uh, especially in aerospace uh, so so in the world when it comes to like rockets and uh, spacecraft and all of that the the the, the place to be is uh, the, the number one place to be is actually LA in um, LA, California. And then um, here in the US, the second place is Denver. There's a lot of action here when it comes to satellite development and um, the defense work and rockets and all kinds of things. So, so this is the place to be. And um, um, and now with the, the, the startup ecosystem also growing, uh, we're finally we're seeing some, um, some sort of um, 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 what's the word like a like a marriage uh, of um, yeah, you know tech startup scene and aerospace development especially right now with the space industry growing there are literally hundreds of um, small companies um, here in Denver uh, growing and, st and startups uh, aerospace startups um, you know uh, uh, propping up everywhere and then they're also what's what's awesome is that uh, aerospace companies i mean startups from other places uh, in, in the country and the world they are actually relocating to denver hey have you heard of this thing called space camp that's down in like the fort carson uh colorado springs area what is it called space camp space camp um i haven't heard of it uh, down in colorado springs yeah yeah suppose they knew how president trump had that space force thing Space mm -hmm. Camp was supposed to be like the, the basically like the software development arm of that. And the only reason I know about it, my CTO from a couple of years ago, he was in the Air yeah. Force. He actually got put, put in charge of all the developers there. So that's the only reason I know okay. about it. Okay. Yeah, I haven't heard of it, but uh, there's a lot going on down in Colorado Springs um, for defense and space. And, and the Space Command is still down there. Yeah. You know, and, um, and then there's the, uh, the Catalyst Campus. Um, and that, that place is like this awesome hub for just connecting with um, uh, 
stakeholders within DOD. And um, it's funny, you can just go over there you know, and enjoy a coffee with uh, a general. <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so, so why do you think Denver is so hot in the space area, space tech area? Why not Why did, Why not Utah or Texas? Why is it the Colorado area specifically, you think? But So Colorado, actually, uh, the Denver area has a long, long history of um, space work uh, back way back in the what is it i think 1940s or something um lockheed martin uh, said established uh, their um, their work here the, the, uh, they've been building rockets uh, for a really long time so the, the talent pool here in denver grew and had, it's been here for for decades um you know back then i think it was called the martin um, it went through so many names. There, were, there was Martin, Martin Marietta, and then there was Lockheed, and, and here we here now we have Lockheed Martin, which is a big, big. Uh, um, they have a huge presence here in the, in, the, in the Denver area with multiple facilities, thousands of people working for Lockheed Martin, and then uh, there are other uh, corporations. So, so as basically as um, um, this as Denver became the the hub for a lot of this. Uh, you know, rocket development, like way, way back in the days, like the Titan rocket and, uh, and other uh, previous rockets and spacecraft, um, more, more, more companies um, set up, set up shop here, so more suppliers for that whole uh, program. And then over time, uh, now, um, now here we have uh, Northrop Grumman, um, Honeywell, uh, Ball Aerospace, and. Uh, um, Boeing, like all the big, all the all the heavy hitters of the aerospace industry are, are have presence here, and with them a bunch of little suppliers, of, like people that that used to work at Lockheed and some of these big guys, they um they they, they left after getting some after getting some experience, they stepped out to start their own little little shops, and and then those little shops um they, they they're growing and now they're being acquired by by bigger holding companies um, and uh, and bigger and, and of course the, the bigger established aerospace companies and, and so now there's this big aerospace ecosystem around here so miguel you're, you're raising funds right now correct absolutely yes but but instead mm -hmm. of uh, correct me wrong but instead of like doing the best right you're doing the crowdfunding right right now right so so right now what we're doing is uh, is actually uh, we're doing a, a a parallel thing. We're raising one point oh seven million dollars through Start Engine, and um, uh, we so far we've raised one hundred thirty two thousand, and then um, in the last uh, couple months, and then uh, we're also raising a, a two million dollar seed round from uh, traditional investors. Um, and on that, we are going through due diligence right now, and we're hoping to close by the end of the month. So, a couple of questions. First question yep. is. Why startup engine versus Kickstarter or all the hundred of thousands of crowdfunding things you're going to use? And then I can imagine the challenge is like, I did a crowdfunding campaign last year, and that's a full-time job. You know, traditional rate funding rate is a full-time job. You'll see all your full-time job. Like, how are you handling all these full-time jobs, so to speak, right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a lot because in addition to doing all of this, um, you know, we um, so we're doing the crowdfunding. The start engine. We're also doing the uh, the fundraising from uh, traditional investors. Uh, on top of it, we're doing engineers. Uh, we have a, have a sister company, an engineering services company, and we're providing engineering services um, to the um, aerospace community. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. I, I do. I have a team. Um, uh, thankfully, I have, a, I have a, right now we have a, we have a team of about ten people, and then we have um, consultants, we have advisors, we have a, a larger pool of uh, technical talent that we pull from as needed. And then we have experience, experienced uh, people from uh, with from from government, from um, uh, from industry, uh, from the telecom world, from different uh, areas. Just providing us guidance and uh, like staying, keeping us focused, keeping us, um, you know, um, um, in line basically. And it's, it's really, it's been, it's been really helpful. I, I, I spent a long time building strong relations with the, with people in the industry. And every now and then um, when I'm freaking out, I just call, Hey, can you, can you help me out here? You know? And yeah. So for the, for the, oh, started, for the starters, are you like sending inverse emails to people in your network asking for donations or to invest or are you like, yeah. sending like group? How, how does that work? Cause like, if you have a lot of connections, mm -hmm. that's a challenge, right? Yeah, so 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 what I'm working with um, uh, for for the start engine, we um, so so for that uh, what we have is um, 
we have um we have a consulting company that we're working with. It's a marketing company. Sorry, it's a marketing company that we're working with, and they're doing a lot of the the marketing for the crowdfunding, and uh, they're also handling all the um uh, the you know, the the re the outreach um to my contacts. And that way, I'm not doing all of that myself. So yeah, that, that can be painful yeah. to do that. Oh, oh yeah, very very painful. So so they are doing all of that. And then um, as they, uh, like they do the big, uh, they, they cast the net, right? They cast the white net. And then as um, as people uh, start start uh, learning about what we're doing and becoming interested, then they um, they reach out to us. And then uh, they, they, they uh, the this marketing company, they handle that second step. And then after that, if they, if, 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 um, if there's still more interest, then that's when I start handling. By the time we get to that level, um, there, there there are fewer and fewer people, but still a large number. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you have to pay them upfront free, or do they get a percentage of whatever you raise? Uh, so with them, it with them it's a flat rate. Um, it's a negotiated uh, flat rate on a monthly monthly basis, and then uh, certain things, certain uh, projects um, can have a, you know, its, its own. Uh, additional price tags, but um, uh, with with this marketing company, it, it's not um it's not a you know, percentage. Now, can you talk about how you pick these this company versus the numerous others out there that do this? Uh, so I um <clears throat> I had an um I worked with a consultant uh, who had uh, worked with other marketing agencies before, and um, through his help, we were able to meet with this marketing agency and um, we saw that they had the, 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 um, the past experience. And um, um, so we chose to give them a try. Yeah, one thing I don't think a lot of founders realize about, about doing crowdfunding, and, and I could be wrong, but like if you do a crowdfunding campaign, let's say you raise like $200,000, you need to put it on your pitch deck to the actual investor, hey, I raised $200,000 for like 200 people. It kind of gives you traction from my point of view. Yeah, it does. It does. So, so it works two ways. Um, uh, actually, you, you answered the question earlier: Why start engine as opposed to Kickstarter or all these other ones? So, so we we did, we, we did some research, and uh, based on what we did, what we looked at, it, it's it's a look, um, we saw that um, the best ones for what we we're trying to do were uh, WeFounder, Start Engine, and Republic. And out of those three, we we're trying to figure out which one to go with. And um, for us. It seemed that um, uh, Start Engine was the best option. I, I can't remember the exact details, uh, but uh, the Start Engine was the best option, so we went with them. And then uh, to, uh, to go back to your question, um, so we are seeing that um, the response from accredited investors or like their, their thought about um, what they think about crowdfunding is it's 50 50 like half the investors are like oh man that's that's awesome that's genius You're, you guys are doing great that's awesome yeah but and then like the other 50 percent say yeah we don't we're not we're not we're not, um, we're not a fan of we're not fan we're not fans of um, crowdfunding <laughs> so yeah it's like investing you talk to 20 investors you're gonna get 20 20 different opinions on every single thing right you just never exactly. know yeah yeah it's 50 50 so yeah yeah. Um, so on, on LinkedIn, you were, you were at SpaceX from 2010 to 2014. First of all, mm -hmm. I had no mm -hmm. clue SpaceX had been around the lot. I thought SpaceX started like in 2016, right? And so you were like no, one of the no. so you were like one of the early people at SpaceX. Uh, kind of. Yeah. SpaceX has been around uh, since um, 2002. So next oh, year, I had, SpaceX. I, oh wow! I had no idea. Oh, this year, actually, this year, okay. this year, I think by September this year, SpaceX will have been around for 20 years. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, the, the thing is, man, at the beginning for the first 10 years, it was a really small company, a no name company. And um, yeah, I joined the company back in 2010. By then, actually, I think it had grown, um, it had grown um, to a certain size. It was, I was employee number 850, I think. Okay. Um, so it, it was you know, a, decent, a decent size. Then. So yeah. how's the experience there? I'm, I'm guessing you, you learned a lot there. Yes, I learned a lot, and um, I um, I learned a ton at SpaceX. I am very happy uh, for that. I I feel very very happy and proud that I was uh, part of SpaceX, and um, it was uh, I would say overall it was my my best experience uh, ever. I think it, it, that's the experience that uh, prepared me the best in the best way possible for what I'm doing right now. So on your company website, there's a statement that says, "Revolutionizing access to space." Can you define yeah. that? 
Absolutely. So, 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 um, you know how there's a there's a common phrase that says that's not rocket science. <laughs> yeah, that's not rocket yeah. science. You yeah. Know? But sometimes so, so, it is. Sometimes it is rocket science, right? Right, right. So, so it's all it's it's implying the difficulty of space launch. It's implying that um, you know uh, rocket science, like launching launching rockets, is difficult. Well, here's the thing, though. Um, rocket launching rockets. Yes, it is difficult. Yes, it is difficult. Um, however, it, you know, the rocket launch, launching to space, especially to low Earth orbit, is even more difficult because since the beginning of, um, of the space age, we've been launching uh, rockets in the same way, using the same propulsion technology, using um, uh, using cryogenics, these, uh, these super cold uh, 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 fluids, and um, and also like for the, for the big booster for the big for the for the big for the thrust that you need, but we've been using these um, these highly complex uh, propulsion systems using um, cryogenics, you know, super super cold um, fluids, and 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 also and, and um, as necessary these uh, solid uh, propellant powered boosters that, that not that are not easy either, and um, once they start burning, they can't stop. <laughs> And then on top of that, on the on the second stage, uh, for like additive control, for control yaw pitch roll for that, uh, we are using like you see these nasty toxic chemicals. If you're exposed to those chemicals, you either die or you get cancer. There's no other option. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I horrible have, options. Yeah, we have two horrible options. You either die or you get cancer. And thing and is, you, I, I could be wrong. I don't know anyone who has survived cancer. Even if it goes away, it eventually comes back, right? Right, right. That, that's the thing. Uh, you, I mean, it, it depends. Of course, it depends on the on the amount of exposure. You know, you can still you can get away with a little bit, but um, um, it, it's some nasty stuff with, uh, that we do that we deal with. Um, this is why uh, rocket like launching rockets is really difficult because we're using we're we're working with these really super cold fluids. We're also dealing working with. Um, um, the, this uh, highly toxic um, you know, chemical for you know for space applications and um, all of that is just really really hard to do and the thing is I've, I've been through this I've, I've been doing this for 20 years and I can tell you it is crazy hard now once you take the toxic stuff out of the picture and then you start working with uh, uh, with with propellant with with uh, some some other fuel that's um, kind of like gasoline where you don't necessarily need um, you know, a mask uh, and gloves to handle gasoline. Uh, with with our fuel, just for safety precautions, for precautions we we use um, typical safety glasses and rubber gloves essentially, just to not get um, some on your skin. Because the worst thing that could happen is you get some on your skin, and yeah, you get some. Some bleed, some minor irritation. That's it, you know. And um, imagine, imagine that. Imagine going from being so freaking careful with it, with a crazy bunny suit, uh, handling this highly toxic chemical that could give you cancer, to ha just ha handling this other chemical that, hey, at, at, at worst, it'll it may just give you a little irritation on your skin, you know. That that right there just completely, completely changes the. Uh, the manufacturing process, the assembly and integration, the full handling process, that, that whole process gets, becomes so much uh, um, you know, faster, cheaper, and clean, environmentally clean and less hazardous. Now, on top of that, you, you get rid of the cryogenics, you know, the super cold uh, fluids that you need for, for boost, for the thrust, and you use some uh, the same thing. You know, use something that's uh, that you can easily touch, and um, you, know, you know, just with just with just gloves. And uh, then that's two things. That's two major things. Not dealing with toxics. Not not dealing with cryogenics. All of a sudden, rocket launch gets so simple. They get it's so much simpler. Then then um, you, they still have to deal with avionics, um, you know, other things. But at that point, um, well, you know what. Airplanes deal with avionics issues too. You know, it's um, it, it's um, um, it gets a lot more simplified, basically. So that's what I was referring to. So uh, in the '60s, you know, we had the space race for the Soviet Union to get the moon first. We got there first. I think we went to the moon a couple times after that. We had the mm -hmm. space shuttle. 
But since they wouldn't have really done anything working in space, right? You would think based on getting the moon in 69, it would have been on Mars and different places, like put people on different planets. How come, why do you think this didn't happen? Like budget restraints or it wasn't a focus of country anymore? Or what do you think the reason for that is? You know, that's that's a, a great question. So I was born and raised in Peru. I was I was born in I was born in this um, little village up at ten thousand feet up in the Andes Mountains. I had no idea about. Uh, I, I wanted to build something that went to space, and um, so then that's why I moved to Lima, the capital city. And then from there, when I learned about um, it, when I figured out that I couldn't um, to be a rocket scientist, I couldn't stay in Peru. I uh, I was looking for places to go, and because I already had family here in the states. I moved to the states. Like I wanted to be here. I, I, I had this. Uh, I was in love with um, with America and uh, with uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, aerospace industry here, with uh, the Apollo program, with the space shuttle program, with all of that. And um, um, and then so I came here. I came to the states, and um, and then I what what I realized as I was working, <coughs> excuse me, in the industry is that. Even though we were doing amazing work, like, uh, like, like eighties um, from like fifty, from like nineteen forties to to like nineteen seventies, I would say we were doing just great work. We were just <clears throat> kicking ass. And then you know what happened? We got complacent. <clears throat> we got we got complacent. We, not only that, we we, not, we got complacent, and also. Uh, we had um, uh, some of these um, big companies. By the way, they're they're good. They're good people. Good companies. You know, I have lots of friends in these big companies. However, well, we got too complacent um, with um, being, being, you know, being at the top, being leaders. At the same time, uh, w when these big corporations um, got so big, um, they they didn't they, they lost the desire to keep innovating. You know, they were more focused on the bottom line um, and um, they realized that um, they could get them, um, they could get them um, just as much funding, if not more, by just delaying projects because the government had no other option, <laughs> you know, yeah. so then they, so then we, you know, we became complacent and, and here we are, you know, uh, working, um, working, developing rockets and, and uh, spaceships, uh, where, um, Taking you know decades when back in the seventies, man, um, they moved so much faster, and that's that's what it is. We got too complacent and we got too um, um, like too cautious, I think, uh, with uh, with spending money uh, to the point that here we are, you know, um, back uh, in, in in the in the last um, you know, forty years or so. Yeah, since the space shuttle, we haven't really. Made that much progress in in aerospace and um, in space here in the U.S. And we have done some things here and there, but uh, not as much as like well, as we would have thought, considering that back in the seventies we were already in the moon, you know. So 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 yeah. So that's what happened. And then um, and, they, and, and and then when it comes to space launch, for example, it's been it, it's been so stagnant, you know. It, no, no, nothing happened until Elon came around. In the early two thousands, and um, and he, him, and, and of course SpaceX with the, the team on SpaceX, they changed the pattern. They changed the um, the way they they showed how space launch could be so much cheaper, so much cheaper with uh, with multiple changes, with multiple with uh, and the thing is uh, with only with, with about three things they 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 changed the three things. One was um, um, the uh, um, they focused on a vertical integration. You know, when you when you're vertical, vertically integrated, when you have more control over your supply chain and your entire team, uh, that you can you have you can move so much faster. Whereas other companies, other aerospace companies, that, um, rely on like like a like a big uh, like dozens and hundreds of uh, of suppliers. Um, where you lose control of um, schedules and priorities, um, SpaceX went the other way, vertical integration. And that was a huge shift. Um, and so I can continue. Go ahead. You, you yeah. Have a question? So, so I know Elon Musk, he takes a lot of criticism, I think unfairly, but I don't think anyone can deny that he's making the world a better place, right? With all the stuff he's doing, right? 
Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So, so he, I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm a liberal. I am, I am on the, on the liberal side. My views are very liberal. Uh, but when it comes to some of these things, when it comes to uh, like all the changes that Elon's um, um, envisioning that, that are that are positive for the world, I think he's doing great things. Um, on a personal level, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> I'm not gonna say anything. Uh, but but. Um, uh, I mean, he, what he's doing is um, is great. Like Tesla, amazing work. SpaceX, amazing work. And what he was what he was trying to do with Solar City, great, great stuff as well. You know, um, and this, this is um, and, and what's what's uh, what's awesome about SpaceX is that um, is that um, it, a place like that attracted so so many other uh, people like Elon, and and if and right now. It's it's uh, so great to see so many um, ex SpaceX employees running, starting their own startups. There are so many right now. Uh, the people that uh, that, that run um, that started Relativity, they came from SpaceX. You know, uh, people that uh, that are now um, like myself. I was at SpaceX, and so many others. So we're talking about that by now. I think dozens, if not hundreds, of um, ex SpaceX pe SpaceX people that are starting their own um, aerospace companies or other. You know, related companies. Yeah, kind of. I, I follow the Joe Rogan podcast and this podcast called Lex Freedom Podcast. Lex is out of Austin too. He's like an AI data science guy, and you know, I must have been on both podcasts several times. Every time I listen, I, I just feel like my IQ getting higher and higher, right? Just by listening to what he's talking about, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, anyway, you had a question? Yeah. So, um, I just have to wonder how how much how like what did we not gain by not going to space like we should have? Like what like. Maybe we would have found the cure to cancer. Maybe we would have found another civilization. Like, how far behind have we put ourselves on not, you know, being more proactive and going to space? Right? What, what opportunity? What opportunities have we missed? Right? Uh, so the biggest thing here is, um, man, um, it has to do with our climate. Uh, we, um, so, so, so we've been, we've been uh, using fossil fuels and, uh, and we've been mining in, uh, in environmentally um, delicate areas for way too long. It, you know, it's, um, we, ha we have, here's the thing, we have with these giant diamonds, <laughs> like we have like, like giant blocks of um, different precious metals just floating up in space, you know? Uh, it's, um, it's really not that hard to go over there and grab some of that and bring it back and you know put it to use for us. You know, it, 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 of course, it is going to at the beginning. It seems harder than just going to somewhere in uh, Africa and uh, digging up a mine. Um, yes, it is. It, it could be more difficult than, than that. But th there's where we come in. There's where innovation comes in. There's where automation comes in. There's where robotics comes in. A lot of what we're trying to do here on, in, in space could be um, could be done by robots. We don't need to be uh, sending people out there to do this stuff, you know. So so I I, wish, um, I think that um, right now um, we uh, we've we've put so much focus on relying on fossil fuels that are that are finite here on the planet. Same with mining, you know. Um, we're, we're digging holes everywhere and impacting the environment and uh, and now we are dealing with all with with the consequences and i wish um, you know decades ago when we saw when we noticed that the glaciers were were um, melting a little bit and um, you know uh, what um i wish we had seen that and we, i wish we had pushed harder to innovate to to get out there and collect all the riches that are in space there are literally uh, trillions and, and trillions of um, uh, of uh, uh, of dollars worth of minerals out there just floating, just hanging out, you know. <laughs> yeah, talking about, talking about consequences. So I'm from the West Texas area. I grew up in Odessa, Texas. And of course, they don't all the fracking there, right? And now they're having like almost daily earthquakes. There was never an earthquake in West Texas before, right? So because of the fracking, how that that stuff works now, they have earthquakes all the time, right? They're not mm -hmm. big, like but like three point five four. So that's you know kind of big, right? And then mm -hmm. they were never happy before because of fracking is happening oh. now. Of course, the oil companies, oh no, has nothing to do with fracking, but okay, it has to be some, It's not a coincidence, I don't think. No, no, it's it's not. And then, then like in, like for example, this this year here in Denver, we haven't gotten snow uh, since until last week. We just got snow, 
And um, you know, here in Denver, it typically snows. Uh, it starts snowing in, in October, November for sure. By November, it's snowing, and uh, you know, the ski resorts open, and um, it's all great, you know. And um, and here we are, you know, this December, and we barely got some snow. I went to the mountains um, last weekend, and um, um, I, I, it, it was sad to see this uh, this ski hill, like half the hill closed. And some of the other hills, I was, I was looking at some of the other ski ski resorts. And at one place, oh man, um, one of the one, one of the coolest places here in town, one of the closest places in town, great for beginners. Um, they they were only like twenty nine percent open. You know, that's that's what's gonna happen. Like it, it's a like you know we we love like some of us uh, we know we love going to the mountains, we love going skiing. Like I, I love to go snowboarding, but. Um, well, over time, in a, in a few, what uh, what I'm, um, it's, it's looking like, uh, you know, I think by 2050, um, what is it, like 50% of the ski resorts will not have enough snow. They will not be able to get co uh, cool enough to keep um, uh, in the snow. And then uh, it sounds like uh, by 2080 or so, with 20, maybe it was 2100, um, you know, 80 percent of the um, ski resorts will be gone. So here's my snow story for you. So when I was in the army, I had to go to a dental for a cost to do some army stuff, right? And so it was supposed to be the few days. It was supposed to fly out. We, we got stuck there for three days because the blizzard came. The month was July. It just blew my mind. Like, how is it snow in July? This is like crazy, yeah. right? But they yeah. were like, no, this is normal. We, yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> my mind. Yeah. 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 The thing is, here's the thing, though. Um, so... Let, let, let's say let's say that um, that uh, we still want to use fossil fuels. Let's say that we still want to do these other things because it makes money and everything else. Well, you know what? How about this? How about we come up with ways that both things can exist? How about we think about ways to to regulate the um, the, the the environment better? You know, and like we we have. I think we need to put a lot of focus in. Um, in uh, like earth science and um, in, um, in the, uh, so this is a I'll share something really really funny with you really interesting. Have you heard of Nostradamus? Yes, I have. Okay, okay, okay. So so I so uh, I saw that um, um, that he had. Uh, by the way, I don't I don't believe in this stuff. Okay, <laughs> but, <laughs> but 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 back in I think it was around in the fifteen hundreds or something fourteen hundreds. I can't remember, but he had. Um, um he he had um uh what's the word he had foretold that um by the by this century and the next i think um that we were going to um humanity we were going to uh, develop ways to manipulate weather on earth so so it's more um um, I guess livable, you know, for uh, for us. And well, you know what? We're gonna have to do that. We at, at the rate that we're doing, if we don't make, if we don't, if we don't make any changes, man, it's gonna be pretty uh, pretty horrible here. I mean, we're we're already seeing um, uh, like climate change you know, uh, in, in influenced migration. There are some places where you can you can no longer, you know, um, grow stuff and. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is going to happen regardless of uh, on which side of, of, on the political you know, spectrum you, you stand. It's um, it's going to happen. We just need to figure out what to, what to do. It's, it's, it's not, um, this has nothing to do with uh, being a tree hugger or whatever. It's it's a problem that we all have to deal with. And, um, and I'm glad that um, there's more funding now for like climate, uh, you, know, you know, like clean tech and things like that. And um, I think there's more awareness now. So I'm hoping that we can um, we can uh, clean up our home. <laughs> yeah. It's the only home we have right now. <laughs> so Miguel, I'm pretty sure the same way, but back in the day, you know, if you had, if you want to be a NASA astronaut, you have to be like top of the top, you know, one percent, whatever, like that, great shape, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But now, like, you know, really, I'm shadow with the space at 90 years old, right? Now, of course, it, it, did he really go to space? You know, it's part of the upper atmosphere, so he didn't go to, like, moon or anything. But how in shape do you have to be to go to space, right? If, you know, like, people, like, nine years old are going there now. Was that really a requirement mm -hmm. or something that's made up? Uh, so so that, that's a really good question. Um, 
so growing up, I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> and uh, growing up, I was actually pretty fit yeah, until started getting until I got a desk job. <laughs> so so yeah, so, so because I wanted to be, be prepared to to um, uh, apply to be an astronaut, but um, uh, based on what I learned, um, those requirements uh, that they came up with was um, that I could be making this up, but based on my understanding, um, all of that was because of what we could do with the technology that we have. What, what I'm going with this is that I think over time, we will be able to develop capabilities um, to allow anybody um, tra travel to space. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like, for example, um, back in the day, this is, think, think, look back uh, like 500 years ago. Okay, when uh, when there were no airplanes, uh, the, and, and uh, the only way to get across the Atlantic was with a big boat, and it would take like a month. You know, you, well, um, on that boat, you wouldn't it wouldn't be safe to send uh, little kids and you know, elderly people because um, the, the the chance of them surviving that, uh, that, that 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 travel that trip across the Atlantic, especially like in the middle of winter. Um, that, that you know, it was very dangerous, right? So, so now, 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 you, you could send anybody on, on an airplane um, from New York to London, and they're fine. They're going to be fine. They're going to with no issues whatsoever. So I think that's what it is. I think that we will get to the point when um, when uh, going to low Earth orbit will be like going to London. <laughs> it's, I think it, that, it, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Yeah. So, so Miguel, um, your company is on several social media platforms. I think you're doing a great job pushing content out by your company. But see if, see if you want to talk about a YouTube thing you did on YouTube channels. You did an investor question and answer. I thought that's, mm -hmm. that's a brilliant idea, right? Like, I mean, I'm actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy that when I do my own stuff. <laughs> I mean, I just thought it was a brilliant idea, right? How did you come up with that idea, and how and did you get any um, good feedback from that? We did. We actually got good, you know, really good feedback, and we got some, you know, some, uh, some a little boost on the investment right afterwards. And um, it's interesting that you question that. Because, I mean, you answer that because uh, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting that you brought that up because uh, we are doing the the, uh, the second episode of that webinar in two hours from right now. Oh wow! And like, yeah. like, do you like how do you like invite investors you know to come to it, or how do you make sure investors are on there, or like how does that work? So our. Um, uh, this uh, marketing company that we work with, they do the um, the outreach. They 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 go reach out to our investors, our audience, basically our online audience, and uh, our mailing list. And um, they gather some people um, to get them ready for the event. Yeah, I don't think I ever seen anyone do. That. I just thought it was a brilliant idea. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. So next, thank can you. you talk about the difference between a software engineer and a software developer? Mm -hmm. Is a software engineer they mainly work on hardware products, and a software developer works on like a software, so to speak. Or is there a different difference, or is an engineer and software developer like kind of interchangeable? Uh, I think they're the same. I think, uh, yeah, I think they're the same at, at this point. A software developer and a software engineer they're pretty much the same. I think uh, I would think so. I, I'm not a software guy. I'm a I'm a mechanical engineer. <laughs> I, I can I can talk about both propulsion and the structures. But man, when it comes to software, <laughs> that's just not me. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. And so you're actually a co-founder and CEO at two companies, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So talk about the channels of that, right? I mean, because like like I said before, you're doing the crowdfunding, the fundraising, two mm -hmm. CEO jobs. Like, how are you doing all this? So, so I had to put, unfortunately, I had to put the other company on hold. So what happened is that um, I, I joined... I co-founded Exodus Space back in um, the summer of 2018, and um, we had this uh, crazy idea of um, of developing a fully reusable space plane, two stages to orbit space plane, and also it could be used for one point-to-point uh, -point transport, um, suborbital point-to-point -point transport across uh, continents. Great concept. We did uh, some trade studies, and it was actually pretty viable, especially with the technologies that we have available right now, or are becoming available over the next um, five years or the next decade. And it all seemed great. However, uh, we were what we realized was that we were a little too early 
for um, uh, for the world and for the investors and um, um, and then we um, basically we, we realized that uh, something like that was um, a project for for either national research facilities or billionaires with deep pockets and um, we were have we were struggling with fundraising for something like that at that, at that early stage and then um, then what, what happened also is that in the summer of 2019 um, I had a, a horrible car accident, car accident uh, and it, it just you know myself my wife like my entire family were in the car and we were um, thankfully, the kids were fine, but my wife and I, we, we went through months of uh, physical therapy and I had to put the fundraising on hold for that startup. And, um, and then, uh, right as I was getting it back on my feet and getting ready to fundraise again, COVID happened. <laughs> so then I had to, at that point, I just said, you know what, I just said, okay, this is a sign. Let's just put this aside. Let's, let's think about something else. And, um, and that's when, um, at the time, I was looking for... Um, I was trying to figure out how we could um, uh, move quickly with this space plane development. And the space plane, what we were looking at at Exodus Space was uh, for the space plane to use uh, you know, non-toxic, non-cryogenic propulsion, rocket propulsion. And, um, and that's something that we were going to develop within Exodus Space. But then we, I was thinking, you know, through the pandemic at home with nothing to do, <laughs> thinking, okay, how can, how can we, do this. Maybe, maybe what I need. To, I, I thought maybe what I need to do is instead of trying to develop the propulsion technology, maybe I should see if there's somebody in the world that has already developed this propulsion technology. And and sure enough, I um, I found out uh, about uh, Aphelion orbitals. With now Aphelion Aerospace, I um, I found out about the Aphelion orbitals, and um, I um, uh, I learned about um, Matthew Travis who was one of the original founders and they had developed this, um, this non-toxic, non-cryogenic propulsion technology uh, for, um, for rocket and, and uh, spacecraft. And um, I reached out to, to Matthew. This was uh, last summer in 2020, 2020, yeah. And, um, and then we talked for a few months and then I joined the company as a COO. And then um, shortly after, as of April of this year, I'm the CEO <laughs> of Affiliate Aerospace. Uh, basically, well, the company that was supposed, that was going to be our supplier, uh, be, I became part of. <laughs> okay. So um, as a startup founder, you know, your days are busy, right? How mm -hmm. do you make sure like on a day-to-day -day basis, you focus on things you don't focus on? Like, do you run a calendar? You do set certain tools or do you just wing it? And like and a second part of the question, like, so you have a hundred priorities for mm -hmm. the next day. How do you make sure you focus on priorities one, two, and three versus going to, Priority number eighty-five. That, you know, that's a really good question, and that's that's something that's been challenging for me, um, you know, throughout my career, and um, and also, um, it setting a company that is that is very challenging. It's 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 really hard. And uh, what I'm what I'm doing is, um, um, we uh, we have um, we started with like um like right at, like before we started uh, hiring people. Yeah. Before last summer, what we did is uh, we laid out a plan for the next uh, uh, year, for the next uh, three years, for the next five years, where our, our goals are. We put everything. We we uh, we had we got the, we saw that we put together the big picture, and then from that we worked backwards, and um, we have these uh, right now. We are we have these uh, 30, 60, 90 day goals. And, um, and then based on that, we are uh, dissecting that some more. And then we have these uh, goals for the week, for the month, yeah, for, the, for the week. And then from that, back to goals for the day. And, um, and that's how I'm, I'm able to reduce the number of things that I have down to just a handful of things I need to get done uh, each day. And um, so like I have, um, um, I, I have, uh, let's see, I think I have like 200 tasks. I have like 200 priorities right now. Uh, however, out of those 200 today, I will probably, I will, I will probably accomplish um, five and that's okay. As long, as long as there's progress, I'm good with that. 
Now, again, how do you do this? Like, you know, some people famously work hundred hours a week. Other people work Monday through Friday. You know, different have different different things, right? I, I know mm -hmm. a friend of mine. He works twenty one days in a row, and then takes three days off, right? Or no, four days off, right? How do you mm -hmm. do your schedule? Yeah, that's another great question. So, so I'm actually I'm married and I have three kids, and I try to be I do my best to um, to be available for the for the family for the kids. So when I, when I'm um, when I'm home and evenings and weekends, um, I am full on family. Uh, but then every, every chance I get, I'm trying to do something uh, on my phone. So so the way I do this is. Um, um, in, in the morning, I wake up around um, uh, six or so, six, about six in the morning. I get um, start with I um, I make breakfast for the kids, um, and then I take the dog for a walk. And um, that during so so here's the thing. Before I go back, when I when I wake up in the morning, right at the, um, like around six in the morning, I um, get on my phone and I look at my priorities for the day. Okay, and I make and I look at what things actually need, need to get done, um, uh, and then I see if there are any emails that are really critical that I need to respond. Um, so then I don't respond. I don't do. I don't respond to anything in that in that um, you know, thirty minute period between six to six thirty, unless it's something absolutely critical. Uh, but I just look. I just get a mental picture of what's ahead. Then I make, make breakfast for the kids, and I try to be, uh, you know, there for the kids for breakfast. Then I go, uh, I take the dog for a walk, and during that walk, um, I'm just, I may be walking, I may be physically there, but my mind is just preparing for the day. Okay, what are the things that I'm hey, doing? When you're walking the dog, I'm guess you don't have like any iPhone with you, and like, just you and the dog, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just me and the dog, no electronics. It's just me. And, the, and I'm just thinking, I'm just you know, mentally preparing for the day and actually getting my light exercise. Um, so just mentally preparing for the day. And I come, my, I come home and, uh, and then I, I, um, I, I make it a priority to, take the, to walk the kids to school. My wife and I, we, we walk the kids to school. During that walk, I am I'm doing my best to be fully engaged with the kids. Uh, but at the same time, I am, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, also, even though, even though it's a walk, at least I'm not sitting. So it's uh, another way to like to get my mind. I mean, get my body and mind. Um, yeah, like what's the word? Um, soft. Um, you know, um, flexible. I guess. Yeah. So then I come uh, come to the I come into the office. I show up in the office around nine in the morning, and from then I just just work hard, really, really hard all the way to like 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. Um, and then I go home and, and take a break for like three, uh, three hours during that three hour period until about um, 8 p.m. or so. Um, I, I, am, I disconnect everything and I'm with my family, having dinner, hanging out with my wife. And then around 9 p.m. or so, um, I get back on the computer or the phone and I'm on there for about three hours till till, till midnight. Uh, just at, at that point, and at night, I'm not actually um, doing any um, actual work. I mean, um, I'm not the, at night. I, I use that time for research. During, during the day, like I I, I use the um, the 9 p.m. I mean, the, I I use the 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. block uh, for meetings, for discussions, for getting things um, you know, for communication. At night, I try not to bother my teammates. I try not to bother anybody, and I focus on research between nine between nine p.m. to midnight. That's um, that's where I, I'm researching. Where I'm maybe sending out a few emails if necessary, but it's mostly for research. Yeah, I think you bring up a great point. You know, nowadays people say you know listen to podcasts, read books, content, content, content. But I think we tend to forget what a great thing it is like to have nothing on, right? Just like have maybe 30 minutes a day of just like nothing in your brain, right? And just let your brain like operate freely. And like, uh, like I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I try to do it once a week. I'm trying to do it once a day. But like all the ideas that come in your brain that, that you didn't even think of before because you like outside stimulation kills your brain waves, I think, right? So I think it's a great yeah. thing you're doing. Yeah, it's a uh, man. It you have to disconnect you have to disconnect even for like 30 minutes a day it, it's it's nice to just 
just just look around, you know, and and where we live, at, you know, Denver, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yes, even Denver is a great place, beautiful place. <laughs> yeah, so it's nice to just walk, look look around, you know, and just um, smell the roses. <laughs> so, do you have a certain time of your day that you do like I think it's called like deep focus or deep work? Um, so, deep focus. Um, it would be mostly in the mornings. So um, between between nine a.m. to uh, noon, uh, that's when I'm the most productive. So anything critical, I try to do it between nine a.m. and noon. Uh, Can you talk about the points of uh, of your spouse or your close family, your close friends, like really supporting you as a startup founder? Okay, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Can you talk about the importance of your either your spouse, your close friends, or close family, the ones closest to you, supporting what you do as a startup founder? Oh man, it is so critical. It is so. I honestly, man, I am. I owe the world to my wife. My wife, uh, she. I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing if I if I if it wasn't for her. Uh, but if I, if I was by myself. I think what I'm doing would be much, much more difficult because um, uh, her and I, like personality-wise, we balance really well. I'm the risk taker and I'm the extrovert. She is the introvert. She is the uh, uh, risk averse, uh, but but not extremes, of course. We're not. We're, you know, it's, it's not completely extremes, but like you're, we're on the uh, on on different on the other side of the of the center, I guess, and then. Uh, when we talk to each other, when we you know, when we keep that open communication, we are so effective. And um, she really helps with, um, with with the kids, and she takes care of the kid, takes care of the home essentially. And I'm able to focus on the business. Yeah, I know if I was a married, I'd probably live in my office. It's probably lead a burnout really pretty pretty quickly. So <laughs> she, she's my my motivator to get home every day. You know. Mm -hmm. So next, yeah. you you always talk about the sum, but can you talk about how you take care of yourself? Uh, so on that on that one, you know, I need to do better. Actually, I've been in um, over the last uh, few uh, few years, I've been more um, sedentary, just sitting on the um, sitting and doing you know doing office work. Uh, that's why I, I got a dog, so I could walk, so I could do stuff, and and it's um and it, and it's and it's an active big dog, so. I go around and you know, do things. So right now, um, for right now, I, I, I try to make sure to walk every day. And um, in the weekends, I make that, that time available to play with the kids and we go do things. Like over the weekend on Sunday, we went down uh, snow tubing. And you wouldn't think, but man, tubing, even if it's just um, you know coming down and then going up uh, this uh, conveyor belt, it's still tiring because you're still at like ten thousand feet. So, so it was it was fun. It was um, and I, I tried to keep the week weekends active, active, and um, I tried to um, uh, get my physical checks every year, you know, and um, everything seems to be going well. And also, uh, this is one of the things that I recommend to everybody. I know some people still think that uh, mental health is. Um, is nonsense that the psychotherapy is nonsense uh, but no, you know what man I, I highly 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 value mental health and psychotherapy and I do have a psychotherapist that I talk to uh, once a week and uh, I'm able to just have that one hour where I can just talk about some of the things that I wouldn't be comfortable talking about with my wife or with my colleagues or or whoever um, or my friends, you know, and because um, the thing is, whatever, it, it, you, you can share as much as you want with your wife, but you also don't want to freak her out. And same with your friends. You don't want to be sharing all this crap <laughs> with your with your best friend. Your buddy would like, do it, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so, yeah. And yeah, then so even, even though, like, you might have co-founders, like, you just see you might have co-founders, but, like, how much do you really want to share your co-founders, right? Because, like, you share too much, yeah. they're going to they're gonna lose, like, you know, or, um, faith in you as so to speak, right? So yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. a tricky thing. Exactly, yeah. You, there's only so much you can share with your friends and your spouse and your um, and your, co uh, your colleagues. And it's not that you're trying to hide stuff. It's just that, hey, you know, the, the, we have to be respectful, respectful of people's um, um, time and... Um, um, feelings and you know it, we can't just be like 
telling your your whole life story to yeah plus you don't know how they're gonna react either right they might react a way that you don't expect you know and throw you exactly. the loop. exactly so so yeah so i i highly recommend um, every uh, startup leader uh, to have um, uh, to take mental health very very seriously uh, because what, I, what i've been seeing too i don't know how common this is i haven't done enough research but um um man this is scary. I, I, I don't mean to talk. I don't really want to talk about this either. It's uncomfortable, but but, it, but I think it needs to be told. Um, I, I, I'm seeing um, some um, some cases of um, suicide and uh, depression uh, amongst the um, startup founders and leaders. And it's um, it's concerning, you know. And yeah, it's something so, no one no one wants to talk about, right? Right. But exactly. It it, it happens. Uh, I just heard about uh, this 32 year old um, startup founder um, that committed suicide, I think. Oh, I, I think. I, I, but something happened and she died at 32. And um, yeah, uh, and so, the challenge is like so, no one knows someone else is going through, you know, and I, what's, what's the rules? Like you ask someone how you're doing, they say, okay, you don't, you don't mm -hmm. dive any deeper. And then things like, you know, something's going on, are they, are, are they really going to tell you, right? So yeah, right, you never know. Right. Yeah, and that's the thing. As, as a startup leader, um, especially with investors, you have to be, you know, in your game. You have to be you know, enthusiastic, and you gotta, you gotta, you have to look like you, you got every, you have everything under control, uh, which you know, um, that that's critical. But at the same time, everybody, you know, we all need to take care of ourselves. Yeah, and I'm sure every investor would deny this, but if if they're getting pitched by a star founder and that star founder said, "Well, I want to be honest with you, I'm kind of getting depressed right now." I mean, yeah. I mean, that'd be a deal killer problem, you know. I'm probably exactly. not consumer, or you know. I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. every investor would deny that, but like, why, or like, why are you investing in a company who who is a startup founder of one of the co-founders saying they're they, they have problems, right? So yeah, it's, exactly. it's a tough thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so I think yeah, yeah the way to um, to take care of that is with uh, some good um, you know, mental exercise, mental mental. Um, some, some mental time, basically, having the ability to vent, to vent in front of somebody and uh, hearing some professional uh, feedback and um, um, having somebody who is trained to listen to you. That way, when you come into the office, you can be on your game. And yes. So, so Miguel, a couple of weeks ago, y'all finished a, a new engine design. Can you talk about the process for designing the engine? Like, why, why do you have to design a new engine? Just the whole process of that. I'm pretty sure that, like it's that doing that's probably way harder than it was easy. Oh, so so the engine, um, so we designed the engine back. In, we designed and then built and tested this engine back in 2018, and everything went went really well. Uh, however, what happened is that uh, back in 2018, um, we couldn't collect really good data uh, from um, the. Um, from the test stand because um, uh, the, the the whole uh, the test um, fixturing, let's say, the te the test mounting uh, wasn't as good as it could have been. So so really, the, the the engine that we're testing now, the engine that we're preparing to test right now, uh, it's really the same engine that uh, we designed. Uh, we built and tested back in back in 2018. What's changing is the uh, the mounting um, method for this engine, the testing process, so we can get more accurate data. And that's all. Okay. Um, so where do you keep all your engines? At? I guess you have a warehouse somewhere that you store everything at. How does that work? Oh yeah. So so right now we have um, here in Denver. Right behind me, uh, we we have a um, a five thousand square foot facility. Actually, it would be uh, it would be more like seven thousand. Uh, we have a we have a seven thousand square foot facility here, um, here in here in Denver. And um, I'm in, in in one of our office spaces. Uh, we have uh, we have a lab lab space uh, right below me, and then right right next to us, there's a uh, we have a shop space. Um, um, so so we have plenty of space here to store our. Our engine, and we are actually um, we just moved into this facility uh, this year from New Jersey. The company used to be based in New Jersey. Now we're here in Denver, and um, we are going to be setting up this um, this uh, area with uh, cubicles, with um, um, with a clean room, with uh, testing equipment to test spacecraft, all that good stuff. 
So when you, mean, actually start, when you actually start launching, where are you going to launch them from? Do you have that decided uh, yet? Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, so initially, um, we're going to start the suborbital launches. Uh, we're, we're talking to the uh, Oklahoma spaceport to start uh, to start the suborbital launches out of Oklahoma. And uh, turns, turns out the, spa the spaceport there is only like eight hours and a half from from where we are right now. So it works out. Uh, we can just uh, take the rocket um, on, a, on a truck and then launch it <laughs> right in the Oklahoma. And then when it comes to orbital launches for that, we're working with uh, the uh, Pacific Spaceport up in uh, Kodiak, Alaska. And um, yeah, so we, we, we need to do orbital launches from Alaska first. So Miguel, um, on paper, it seems like you've built, you have a great team. Can you tell about how you convinced these great people to come work for you or come with you or come with you on this journey? Well, um, so um, I think what helps me is uh, my own uh, background. I've been in the aerospace industry for, um, you know, 20 plus years. And uh, during the first half of my career has been mostly technical. And then the second half has been mostly on technical leadership, uh, project management, uh, program management. Um, and, um, and I've been involved, like you said earlier, you know, reading my bio, uh, you know, I've been involved. Um, I started my career working on the space shuttle program, <clears throat> but way back in when I was in college, um, I worked on the uh, boosters uh, for the space shuttle, the solid rocket boosters. Uh, then I went on to, to Honeywell, uh, through Honeywell, I worked on the International Space Station, station uh, fighter jets, the F-35 fighter jets. The, um, I, went, I did some work for the space shuttle again, and then for um, uh, some missiles. And then I went to SpaceX, at SpaceX, um, worked on the Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, uh, uh, some some work on the Dragon spacecraft, then um, Lockheed working on the Orion spacecraft and uh, the um, A2100 satellites, then at ULA um, through Vulcan, you know, the Vulcan rocket, and then recently through my consulting company, Agile Engineering, I've also been supporting ULA on the, um, uh, on, the, on the final um, development of the, uh, not development, sorry, on the final integration of the, um, uh, of the uh, upper stage uh, of the SLS, the, of the Boeing SLS rocket. So ULA has a contract with Boeing uh, for putting, for, for providing the upper stage for the SLS rocket. And on that, um, I've, been, I've had some part on that um, recently. So, um, so yeah, so basically I've been, um, I've been building rockets and spacecraft for 20 years, and um, uh, with that, I carry some credibility, and I was able to to convince um, you know, Matthew Matthew Travis, the original founder, to take me on and uh, to have me as CEO. And then, uh, over the years, since I've been at multiple companies, I've built uh, a, big, a big network, especially on LinkedIn, of um, experts in the field, people that I know, ex SpaceX people, ex Blue Origin, ex uh, you know Lockheed people that uh, that want to uh, join new new uh, ventures and uh, they want to have a bigger uh, they want to have a bigger, um, what do you call it? Um, 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 they want to be able to have a bigger part in uh, certain developments. So Miguel, let's, so if, let's say someone's watching this and they're like, man, I, I, I'm really, I really have a pull for what this company's doing. I want to be part of it. What would they need to do to become part of your team? What do they need to do? Yeah, second part, what, what kind of characteristics do you look for in your hires? So um, let's see. So, so right now we are looking for people. Uh, we uh, we keep our we have, we don't have um, set um, you know, established openings yet. We will soon, um, and then we're looking for um, we're, we're going to be we're looking for uh, for additional leaders to join the C level, the uh, the officer level, and then we're going to be looking for people at the VP level. Also, uh, right at the beginning, uh, right at the bottom, we will be looking for interns for entry level people but in general um, what I what we look for is um, uh, of course you know highly qualified people and um, we value uh, more uh, experience than um, uh, academic training uh, so um, so basically I will take I will take a, a kid out of a no name school that has worked on an amazing project and was able to you know, build and test and successfully um, demonstrate how so, something that they built works. 
And if they can talk, talk me through that, man, that, that is more valuable to me than uh, somebody who has a, um, a, a bachelor's from, um, uh, from a, an Ivy League and they've built nothing and they have no idea about the whole build process. So, so yeah. So, so Miguel, in December, you got a, a new a member of your board of advisors. Can mm -hmm. you talk about the points of having a board of advisors as a startup? So uh, what we've noticed uh, uh, is that um, is that right at the beginning it is very very valuable to have uh, some um, uh, some well known industry leaders to to vouch for you uh, because they have these um, these long established networks they they, they have uh, the ability to to reach out to big stakeholders within the Department of Defense and NASA. Uh, you know, they, they, some of these people, they may be their friends or people they know, or they know somebody that knows somebody and they have really strong networks. So uh, because, um, you know, we are kind of, um, um, we, because we're not so popular in the aerospace industry, especially because we don't have that, uh, that close of a relationship with big stakeholders within the government. Uh, for that, it has been very valuable to have, uh, you know, um, experts uh, as uh, board advisors uh, helping us with that reach to those, um, you know, key players in government and uh, the commercial sector too. Can you talk some about the differences doing engineering for a startup versus a large corporation? Oh man, <laughs> that's a good question again. So, so when it comes to a, a established company, uh, it is uh, it, it it's not that common that uh, you can be you'll be involved in um in a in a new cutting edge project and um, and then that you will have the ability to wear multiple hats and uh, and uh, do many things and also. And being able to see your project from beginning to end, uh, that doesn't happen that often in big companies. In big companies, um, most of the time, uh, you you have um, you have the responsibility over this little bit <laughs> for uh, of something huge, which which is necessary. Of course, you know we, we do have we, um, in the world we we have these big projects, and some people like that. Some people like um, being uh, being experts of something small. Which is fine, you no. Know? Uh, but um, in small companies, the difference is that uh, you may have this much responsibility um, over over a project, where you, you have a lot more uh, flexibility to get involved and pretty much like put your name on on something you know, that's getting developed instead of being um, employee number fifteen hundred. Uh, of, of, of a project you are like you're like um, employee number two or three of this project so you have a lot more uh, direction a lot more control of uh, of, of the product uh, and um uh, well it all it comes with this challenge too it's a lot of work you have to learn a lot of things and you have to be a self-starter and you have to um, you know, you have to know, you have to know your weaknesses and your strengths, and you have to be a, a strong team player, and um, you have to have a lot of um, uh, self-discipline. And um, but if if you are the right person, the reward is uh, worth it. <laughs> so, Mickey, I suppose someone's out there and they have a business idea, and they're thinking about starting a company, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not sure what should they do. They're just in the beginning stages. What advice do you have for that person? So um, I think that they should um, uh, talk to people. Uh, I think that they should um, like LinkedIn is a great, great, great tool. I think to uh, to find experts in in, in certain fields and uh, and, and also um, networks. There are um, there are um, organizations, um, local organizations, so like for example here in Denver, and um, you know, like now there are all these different uh, programs. Um, Around the, the world that help you uh, put together a, a company, and uh, I think that um, there there are some accelerated programs that are actually pretty pretty worth it. I don't want to, I mean, I'd like to uh, endorse some right now, but I'm not, I'm 
know how it works. But um, yeah, there I think there are some um, incubator programs that are definitely worth it. There are some accelerator programs that are worth it. Uh, there are some training programs uh, out there. There are some events, like for example, here in Denver, um, one of the events that I found valuable, I can endorse this one. Um, I think um, one of the programs that I found valuable here in Denver is the Denver Startup Week. Denver Startup Week is uh, it occurs every September. Uh, I think last year it was in October. But uh, uh, at, at that event, um, you get to meet with lots of other founders uh, that are on the same boat, you know, and um, there you have all, all these um, um, talks with um, a successful um, um, startup founders or, or people that um, are there to provide guidance and um, um, the lots of resources that are available in the local area. So that, so I found that the event very valuable. And, um, and then there are other uh, like industry focused events, networking events. Basically where I'm going with this is that, um, is that uh, uh, it's, it's nice to get out. It, it, um, you really have to uh, get out, seek help and um, to talk to people. A lot of people are really happy about talking about themselves. You know, who doesn't like to talk about themselves? <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so they're, they're, yeah, people are, are happy to talk about themselves. And th there's such a thing as too much networking too. You have to be careful. If you just talk too much and then you, know, you don't get things done. So you just, you need to just- What, what, what they call it, a call it, if you network too much, you're a startup entrepreneur or something like that. Well, yeah, so yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, so it's so, and you do have to prioritize, you know, when you should be going for for um for advice and uh, when you should sit down and get stuff done. So, Miguel, so can you talk about how you validated your idea for this company? So, um, so Affilion, um, before I even joined, I can I think I can speak about how our, my co-founder validated the idea because he's the one that, um, that started this first, and um, and then I joined. Um, but I also saw this as a problem back then, and um, so so what's been happening is that um, is that when it comes to space launch, especially when it comes to um, uh, launching little satellites. Uh, in general, um, you have uh, companies like SpaceX, which again, great company. I was there and awesome, awesome work. Uh, you have companies like SpaceX, you have companies like um, Relativity and uh, all these other launch companies that are building big rockets uh, to carry um, hundreds of um, little satellites at a time to low Earth orbit. Okay, so, so imagine this. Um, that model is kind of like a commuter bus. Say you live in, a, in the suburb and um, you want to go to downtown and you take the bus. This bus could probably take like 100 people. So then to do that, you go to this station at a, at a given um, time. And uh, if you're one of the people, uh, if you're one of the last people getting on that bus, you don't get to, get to choose which seat you sit on, but you sit on that bus anyway. You may be, uh, there may be standing room only, uh, so you take it and then you go on that bus to downtown and then this bus drops you off uh, at some station in downtown and then from there you have to find your way to your final destination. Uh, that, so that's essentially what these big rocket uh, uh, companies are doing. They, they are providing kind of like a bus service for these little satellites. Uh, what we're doing is um, uh, we, are, we are providing a taxi service, a door-to-door -door taxi service that, that uh, picks you up at your door, essentially, and um, drops you off at your final destination in orbit. So in this is kind of like the, what they call, I think it's called like the last mile problem that you're solving? Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. So so not, not, only, not only are we solving, yeah, yeah. So not only are we solving the last mile problem, we are, uh, we are essentially um, solving the, um, the entire launch um, uh, process for little little cubes. That's so, so. Where I'm going with this is that typically launch is, is um, it's uh, uh, when it comes to small cube sets, uh, it's really really expensive for little cube sets. Now, I mean, launch is already expensive it, for any for anything. Okay, but then when it comes to little cube sets. It is ridiculously expensive. You may it may cost you like fifty thousand dollars to build this cube set, but it could cost you like five hundred thousand dollars or more 
uh, like a million dollars to launch it, depending on when to want, when when you want to launch it, and and uh, um, you know all of that, and and who, for example. So so now uh, because you um, because when you're going on a launch that has like a hundred um, um, satellites, and uh, you are some little player in the industry from I don't know uh, Africa somewhere or in South America, you are like secondary or tertiary uh, payload. You're not critical. You're not important. <laughs> so, so, it, so you're not given priority, and that's that's just the, the way it is. You know, uh, you, like on a bus, you may just get sent in your moment. Um, you know, so so now we're with us, uh, with our technology, we have the ability to to launch. Uh, well, um, not only uh, are we are we offering a very very low cost launch service. Also, because we are, we're not dealing with cryogenics and toxics, we can go through the whole launch process, the launch preparation process so quickly. Uh, we can, um, we're, we're right now, in, in the other problem is that the, it takes about one to six years to go from contract to launch. Okay, uh, that's, that's a really long time. And when, when you have a CubeSat, imagine this, when you have a CubeSat that, uh, that only has a lifespan on average of like three to five years, but you have to wait um, like like two years to be able to launch it. That's crazy. And then and then that doesn't include the, how long it takes for that CubeSat to reach its final destination once it's in orbit. Because orbit is huge. Orbit is like this huge uh, you know sphere outside of us. You know, so so it could it could take months. It could take six months, eight months to go from um, from when, where where the rocket dropped off that that, that CubeSat to where it needs to be. And that is just years and years. In, in the end, it, it, yeah, like, like I said, it take a really long time. So, so then what we do is um, we, uh, at this point, with with our business model, with the way we work, because we're dealing with little rockets and non toxic and everything else, we're able to launch from anywhere around the world, wherever we have, um, you know, we are allowed to launch, and um, and then we're, we're able to launch. Uh, we we are we're able to go from contract to launch within a month. And then eventually we, we plan to go from contract to launch within a week uh, for some of those more um, more basic launches. Some some launches that are uh, that are custom those will start will take longer, you know, like defense classified stuff that, that, that always takes longer. But um, we, we we try we plan to go really fast through that launch uh, contract to launch process. At the same time, like I said, uh, we plan to launch from uh, spaceports around the world because another another challenge is that there are literally only a handful of um, launch sites around the world. There are only a few, like you can count with your both hands how many launch sites are around the world that um, they have uh, the capability uh, to, to launch to orbit. And um, so what that's what's gonna happen is uh, with that few launch uh, facilities, um, it's already happening actually, actually right now in Florida. In Florida, uh, all the big dogs like SpaceX and Blue Origin, they, they take priority. So then, if you're a little guy trying to launch out of Florida, good luck. <laughs> so, so that's why yeah, there are there, there are there are more spaceports around the world popping up, popping up. But at the same time, to have a, to be able to launch rockets with uh, cryogenics, you have to have a very complex uh, ground system. It's not simple. It's not cheap. It takes a long time, and it's very complex. But with us, though, with us, we can uh, uh, we can uh, we intend to launch uh, from a portable. Um, like a truck and trailer configuration that, that way we can, we can carry this rocket to the middle of um, um i don't know the amazon or something as long as we have the permit to be able to launch from there we can launch and then we can just move, go back to um uh, to to our facility because our propellant is storable we don't have to fuel the rocket right before launch so Anyway, I could ramble on and on, but <laughs> yeah, Miguel, do you have to get permission from the U.S. government to launch from another country? Uh, so that, um, not sure. We we are we, uh, my uh, my co-founder um, Matthew. He would be able to answer that question. I, I'll have to get back. I could get back on that one. Okay, get back on that one. Uh, yeah. And you already talk about this during the during the during the general talk. But you go, can you go more to your deals about the focus of your company right now and what the vision is for your company moving forward? The, uh, the vision for the company? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, so, so our vision is uh, essentially to, to make um, uh, 
uh, space transport from from uh, the surface of the Earth to low Earth orbit, routine, reliable, and um, low cost, uh, and um, like on demand. And and the th the reason why we, we see that we say that is because uh, is because uh, you know low Earth, low Earth orbit is really not that far. It's only a few miles away, and uh, we think we've been um, using rock. Uh, we've been we've been using the same technology way back in the in the 60s to go to low earth orbit so so like cryogenics are still great but the cryogenics are really they're they're they're, um, they're more for like um, deep space transfer to like uh, the moon or mars or when, when you need that, that that huge thrust that's where you need the cryogenics to go all the way to to um, moon and mars but you go to low earth orbit uh, it, it's we don't, it's too much. It's 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 um, think think about this. Um, uh, like right now, when it comes to cars, for example, cars, uh, like now we we have electric cars. You know, uh, it, right now when it comes to rockets, uh, we are using the same technology as back in the sixties and uh, and 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 um, and um, fifties and sixties. And look at look at the cars now. Cars are using technologies uh, from now, right now. The cars are so much more modern. Than, than rockets, even airplanes are so much more modern than than, than rockets. Rockets are still pretty old school. So, so now, when you when you, when it comes to propulsion, for example, when you change the um, the um, we make it the um, uh, when you don't, don't when you don't deal with cryogenics and toxics, the, the whole thing just gets so much simpler. And that's what we see. We we want to simplify the launch process. We want to be able to uh, launch from anywhere around the world. And at the same time, we want to allow more, um, more people, more, more companies around the world, more research organizations around the world, and more students. And we want to give them the opportunity to be able to, to launch a, a CubeSat, a, a small satellite to space, and um, do, do research because we want to give more people around the world the opportunity to conduct research in space. I think we, we think that we can learn a lot from um, uh, from that, and um, um, yeah, and we want to help with that. So Miguel, I might be making this up, but is this true? Is it true that the tech that was used to put us in space in the '60s is, is pretty much the same tech we have on our smartphones now? I want to say I remember hearing that somewhere. Oh, uh, actually, it's it's even worse. <laughs> it's, it's even worse. You, I would. Oh my yeah. goodness. It, yeah, it's it's man, it's crazy. Like your phone, yeah, yeah, your your phone has more tech than um than all the all the computers that were being used back in the sixties. Imagine that. Like that's what I'm trying to get to. We we are using nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties, so at least at the most nineteen seventies technology for rockets. You know, it's imagine that mind, like, mind yeah. boggling. <laughs> that's that's the thing. That's what's that's what's going on. Yeah, yes, we have improved. Um, um, you know, the computers, the navigation, some of that has improved. But when it comes to propulsion, structures, other stuff, it's still pretty old school. There's a lot of um, uh, work there, and um, and so like right now, uh, you know, it, we need to be looking at the uh, reusability, for example. Like we, for the longest time, until the space came around, we were building a rocket, like single-use rockets. Imagine building this billion-dollar rocket to only use it once imagine if you had to you know build your car to go from here from yeah from here to new york and and then once you once you get to new york you just throw away your car that that's what we're that's what we've been doing that's what we're, we're still doing and that's what someone and many companies are still doing and many companies still plan to do that and it's just so 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 expensive so now, uh, I'm think, uh, SpaceX. I'm so happy that they they, they started working to, you know, towards um, reusability. So now, once you start reusing these, these rockets, uh, then you, the, the cost starts coming down, and um, and then the um, yeah, the, then we are there are many, many companies incorporating um, artificial intelligence and additive manufacturing and um, you know, virtual augmented uh, reality uh, manufacturing processes, things like that. So, so man, I am excited about the space industry um, over the next uh, five years, five to 10 years, over the next couple of decades. I'm so happy to be, to be alive in this era. And uh, I'm so glad that finally, we, we're um, more companies like us are, are standing up and um, you know disrupting this market because so yeah we've been 
<laughs> we've been using old school stuff like really really old yeah. school stuff these, these are definitely exciting times so back to your crowdfunding campaign so a crowdfunding mm -hmm. campaign uh is it equity based rewards based like what's the minimum amount someone can donate uh where does it end and any other information you want to provide about your crowdfunding campaign okay so so um the crowdfunding campaign is the start engine so uh, people just have to go to start engine and uh, look for um, affiliate aerospace um, and uh, it's all one word affiliate aerospace so i think it's like uh, let me see here i, I think it's a uh, start engine yep start engine.com slash affiliate dash aerospace there you go and that'll take you to our page and um we are currently at almost 133,000. It's um, it's for common uh, for, it's for common shares. Uh, each share is worth uh, two dollars and twenty two cents, and the minimum investment amount is two hundred and fifty dollars and eighty six cents. Two hundred fifty bucks. But for two hundred fifty bucks, um, you get um, I guess about a hundred and, and about hundred shares or so, about hundred and fifteen shares, I think. And um, it, this, it's not a donation; it's an investment. And um, we are in a in a growing market, in a, in a, that's that's growing exponentially. And um, it is very likely that um, that uh, the company will be uh, highly, highly valued. I can't get into details; I can't share that stuff. But I'm, I, I, all I can say is that uh, it is very likely that the company will, will be. Yeah, uh, I'm guessing it does you know, it does you no know good. They value the company like a two million dollars, right? <laughs> I mean, that'd be a horrible thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So next off the subject, some, but, um, mm -hmm. so I wish I had a, a picture to show on the screen, but like in, in space, they always sort of like in space, like, you know, like in a flat line, right? There's a the sun, all the planets like right next to each other. Is that really how space is, it looks out at outer space, you know, like, or how does it look different? Is it like in 3D models? Like how does space actually look? Like, always like another thing, like when you see a map of space, you don't see nothing on the top of the earth, the bottom of the earth, it's always like in a straight line. Is that how, and like, and of course all the planets rotate around the sun. Is that how it really looks or is it like a different dynamic? Oh, it's crazy. Space is, uh, I mean, space is, uh, for me, it's fascinating. It's, um, that's, that's not how it, how it looks like at all. The, uh, the planets are, are uh, they're, they're pretty far apart. They're like, they're little tiny grains of sand, but pretty far apart, especially like Pluto, for example, Pluto and uh, some of those, um, um, some of the uh, dwarf planets, they are just uh, uh, way, way out there. Um, yeah, it, it's on, um, like, I think uh, Uranus, I think, it um, it rotates in a different way, and um, yeah, it, there's, there, yeah, the, the, the books don't show so that's not correct, how right? it looks like, no, and it, it's just, you know, you have to, you have to fit everything on one page, on one image somehow, mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah, I remember yeah. I saw one design where, like, it was a thing where it said, like, a how, how, how space actually moves, had, like, the sun in front. All the planets like in, in a gyro scope behind it following it, right? Like half mm -hmm. the people said this is correct, other people said no, this is not correct. Right. Right. Yeah. Some um some planets follow elliptical. Uh, actually, that's I think, think, elliptical, yeah. that's what it was, elliptical. Yeah, yeah. I think I think all planets actually uh, follow elliptical orbits, uh, even with um even the earth, I think has a an elliptical orbit. And um uh, the earth is not uh, it's not a perfect sphere, it's kind of like a it, it, like um, it's fatter on the um, along the equator. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it bulges around the equator. And what's interesting about that is because that that is because um, it's partly because the moon has its own gravity gravitation pull. So the moon pulls the um, the uh, the water from the oceans of the Earth towards it a little bit. That's why there's uh, low tide and high tide. It's, it's the moon pulling and releasing the water of the oceans. So Miguel, do you think there's other intelligent life out there somewhere or you think we're the only intelligent life in the universe? What's your take on that? I, I think that there's absolutely life somewhere else. I think the, that- uh, The universe being so big, like how can it not be something somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah, there, there are, man. Well, it, so the thing is, right now, um, when you're in the city, when, you, when you're in cities and you look up, you only see a few stars, and you think, "Oh, that's it," you know. So, it, like, I grew up in the in the Andes Mountains, way up in the um, in the mountains at ten thousand feet, with no uh, city lights anywhere near. And at night, on a on a on a, on a good night, on a clear night, 
wow, you see the entire Milky Way. You see just so many stars that just you can't even count. There's so many. It's so bright up there. Uh, uh, and then that's the thing. There are right just here on our, on our galaxy. There are from what I hear um, like billions of stars. And of course, um, not all, but a lot of the stars have planets, uh, you know, floating around them. And uh, yes, like we like we see here on, on our, in our solar system. Yeah, you know, there may be eight eight big planets floating around, and uh, perhaps some of them are rocks, and some of them are just gas, gas balls. But then. Um, Every now and then, there, there could be a planet or two that's um, uh, rotating at a, at just the right spot you know, to be able to harbor life, like like here on Earth. And um, Mars seems to be not too far from um, being able to to uh, uh, um, support life uh, with you know some minor tweaks. <laughs> and then and then there yeah there should be there should be many many I'm sure there must be many many Earth uh, Earth like planets around just in, in our galaxy. And then there are so many other galaxies, you know. So, yeah, yeah I'm sure there are many. I'm, I'm sure there are many um, species, many, many life forms so, in the universe. Miguel, is there anything that I should have asked you that I haven't, or anything else you want to talk about? Uh, let's see. Um, uh, yeah, I can't think of anything right now. I think. Uh, uh, Oh, actually, a couple things. Later this month, assuming everything goes well, later this month we're going to be um, uh, testing our rocket engine. So it would be, it would be cool. We, we will let people know that when we're testing, we're going to be testing at our test facility up in Wyoming, uh, just a couple hours north from here. So stay tuned for that. Uh, also, we are. Uh, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, we are going to be. We, we have a webinar in, a, in an hour from now, so we'll be doing that. Uh, just stay tuned. And uh, I'd ask everybody to just uh, to follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, we're trying to put more and more content out there. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, please um, uh, send, us, send us questions, comments, anything you like to info at um, feelingirishpace.com. We want to hear from everybody. We want to hear your thoughts, especially people that uh, uh, that uh, you know want to support us in any way. We love that candidates, uh, you know, um, bright people that want to work with us, talented people that uh, that are humble. <laughs> we, we want to work with them. Uh, also, um, also uh, questions. Uh, we we here's the thing. We don't mind. We and, and we want constructive criticism. If there's something that we could be better, we want to hear it. So, so Miguel, the test launch. Are you going to do that, do that like like live on social media when we do the test launch? Um, no. We we're, we're gonna make sure that everything goes well first. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, because it's uh, yeah, we, we'll record it and then we'll we'll share it. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for listeners who have the links to the social media links and is in a in a, in a um, crowdfunding campaign, and everything else on the show notes, you can find the show notes at www.cabinetshrblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your networks and be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to Jason Cabinet's, Jason Cabinet's Experience on your favorite network, favorite podcast platform. So, Miguel, we can't end of our talk. Can you give us any wisdom or advice or anything you want to talk about? Yeah, yes. Uh, so, a few things um, to, um, to think about here. If you are a. Um, um, so, I know that uh, there's, there's a lot of hype. About uh, young um, entre entrepreneurs uh, starting businesses and stuff. Uh, it's really, really hard. It's it's the probability of somebody fresh out of college uh, being uh, running a successful company is it's really hard. And then as you get older, um, it's on, on the in the later part of your life, it's also hard. And from the research that I've, that I've seen. It is best to, um, I mean, you have a higher probability of success if you run a company, if you start a company at mid-career, meaning in your late 30s, 40s, early 50s, in that 20 year, in that 30 year span from like 30 to 60, that is the, um, that is where you, you have, um, you have enough, some, some experience, enough experience, you have your network, you, have, you still have your energy, you still have, um, you know your your physical health, your mental health, and um, you're 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 better at um, uh, at um, communicating, at um, you know talk, talking to people, 
things like that. So, so um, that's one thing I, I would um, I would advise uh, to people, to young people, to young uh, uh, ambitious people. If you don't have a, a clear um, uh, product to sell right out of college, if you ha if you are want to explore things, you, if you want to figure things out just because you just want to give it a shot, you're probably better off uh, just going to a, a company like SpaceX or like um, you know one of the one of the aerospace companies um, and getting some experience and then in your own time you can, you can while you are gaining that experience in your own time you can still fiddle around and mess around with things and then you can figure out what is it that you want to build so then by the time you're you know by the time you have at least five years experience or ten years experience you have gained all that uh, you know, teamwork you know, experience, all that leadership experience, all that um, in, in industry knowledge and network, so that by the time you get started, you are more informed and you have a you, you can do things better. Uh, now, the uh, another thing is um, uh, when it comes to startups, um, make sure you have a good business plan. You know, work on it before you jump into things. You have a solid business plan. Uh, you don't have to have it all written down. You can have a, a pitch deck. You can have um, you know, some spreadsheets. Um, and um, I always have a, a, a plan A and a plan D and a plan C for for things. You don't don't um, don't assume that all these things are going to work out and you're going to hit your timelines <laughs> and you're going to be under budget. That is never going to happen. <laughs> so so whatever budget you come up with, multiplied by three. Whatever whatever uh, timeline you come up with, multiply multiplied by three. Always have some sort of backup plan for things that, that may work out because uh, when you're starting a company, a lot of things will not work out. So, yep, that's um, that's my advice. <laughs> Miguel, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Jason. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. Awesome.